Today, of course, is Father's Day, and a day where dads get celebrated, and a day that I would say, now as a father of three years, a day that's well-deserved, a day that dads get remembered. But it's interesting, society doesn't respect dads in the way that I think dads deserve to be respected. According to the National Retail Federation, this year, the total amount of money that will be spent this year for Father's Day is estimated at $12.5 billion. Now, before you think, wow, that's a lot of money for dad, just a month ago, there was $19.9 billion spent for mom on Mother's Day. Not fair. And it goes on to say, according to the National Retail Federation, that about 64% of consumers plan to only get dad a card, compared to 81% who plan to get mom a card and something special. So today, because only 61% of our country plans to get dad a card, I want to help you to make sure you get your dad a good card. So I went to the store, and I found a few options for you, a few cards that I really liked. Here's one. Dear Dad, remember my teenage years? And you open it, and it says, My bad. Love you. You know who. <laughs> How about this one? Dad, you took care of me. You bathed me. You changed my diapers, and you paid for everything. I'm sure one day I'll return the favor. <laughs> Someone got that one a little late. Just wait for it. <laughs> Thanks, Dad, for not ever really shooting any of my boyfriends. But now that I'm older, I really wish you would have shot that one. <laughs> Dad, thanks for the genes that provided my crazy good looks. Love your best looking son. Dad, that's actually the one that I got for you today. <laughs> and maybe one of my favorites, the last one, says, without me, this day really wouldn't mean much for you. You're welcome. <laughs> Aren't those great? Aren't those great cards? Well, dads don't really get a lot of respect in society today, in our culture. Even in sitcoms, the dad is the bumbling fool, the brunt of the joke, laughably out of touch. And really, dads seemingly, as society portrays, don't have a clue. So when it comes to listening to dad, why should we listen to dad and the advice from dad? But today we are gonna see some very, very important advice from dad. Now, I'm not talking about your biological father, but your heavenly father. Now, I'm blessed to have a great dad and to have a great relationship with my dad. You know, I love how my dad and I have such a special connection that, you know, we don't even have to say out loud that I'm your favorite child. But I understand for some of you, you might not have that type of connection with your dad. I understand for some of you, you might not even have a dad. Maybe your dad was never there. Maybe your dad never desired to have a relationship, and the relationship that you always desired to have was never there. Maybe your dad was a bad example of what a father should be. Maybe your dad just wasn't around. But even when you feel like you didn't have a dad or don't have a dad. You need to know today on this Father's Day that Jesus wants to be your father. For Isaiah chapter nine, verse six says that Jesus is the everlasting father. So even when you can't look to dad for that advice or look to dad to, to be there for you, listen, you can look to Jesus who is our perfect example and will give to you exactly what you need. No matter how old or how young you are, you can always go to that father. And this father has a word for each of us today. You see, in our verse today, we are given some advice from a father figure. Paul the apostle writes to a much younger man. His name was Timothy. And actually, Paul talking about Timothy writes about him as a son in the faith. So Paul thinks of this young man as a son to him. 
And Timothy looks to Paul as a father. So listen, this verse is inspired by the father, our heavenly father, and is written by a spiritual father to what would become perhaps a future father. But this advice isn't just for a father, but it's really for fathers to remind their kids of and for fathers to declare to others. And for each of us, not only dads, but for men and for women, for young and for old, to be reminded of this day where Paul tells his young protege, his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. He says this, preach the word. Now, preaching the word is what we saw last week in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus talks about as being the light to the world. You see, the advice that Paul gives in preaching the word, Jesus gives us that great commission in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, where Jesus says to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5 that we looked at last week, where Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 14, and he says, you are the light to the world. And in verse 16, so let your light so shine. We are to be Christians that are preaching the word. We saw that as salt and light. Salt is living it. Light is proclaiming it or preaching it or speaking it. We need to be those that aren't only living it as Christians, but speaking it, sharing God's word with people. And we this last week have been challenged to be that light, to turn the light on and to let the light of Jesus Christ who is in you, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to let that light shine out of you. And there's nothing to be ashamed of, of the light of Jesus Christ shining into the world. For in the dark days in which we live, it's what the world needs. It needs the light. The light of Jesus Christ. For the light does two things. One, it exposes sin. But also it lights the pathway to salvation. So when people are trapped in darkness, when you turn the light on, the light comes in to that Seeing the light comes into that environment. The light comes into that situation. The light is what shows people the way of escape. It's Jesus Christ who is willing to free us from our sin and forgive us of our sin and give us an eternal life in heaven. What's so bad about that? Why are we ashamed of letting the light shine when it's what the world needs? In these dark days in which we live, it's what the world needs most. And so we saw last week that we ought to be Christians that let the light of Jesus shine. And so it's one thing to turn the light on, as I challenged you last week, to turn the light on and let the light shine. But it's a whole other thing to keep the light on. And you are the light of the world. And when that light isn't shining bright, we as Christians lose our purpose. You are a light that is meant to be shining bright. And so our spiritual father, Paul the Apostle, writing to Timothy, but really, really a spiritual father to us all. If you are a person that reads the Bible, two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul the Apostle. So really the fact of the matter is Paul is a spiritual father to really all of us as a spiritual mentor, as the Lord used him to pen Words that were inspired by God. And this is what God, our Heavenly Father, would give to you as some advice from Dad today. Not only to preach the word, but he goes on to say, be ready in season and out of season. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says that. Be ready in season and out of season. Now that word ready, to be ready, is an interesting one because it means to be on and always on. That no matter what season you're going through, that you stay on. And so in other words, the advice from the spiritual father is this, turn the light on, preach the word, and stay on. The advice from dad today is don't turn the lights off. 
And I love that because in the advice that we so often get from our own dads is make sure you turn the lights off. We get the advice from dad, don't turn the light off. Of course, spiritually speaking about our own lives, the light of Jesus shining bright. The message today is to keep the light on, to keep the light on. But you might be wondering how? Okay, I I want to keep the light on. I want the light of Jesus to be shining in me and out of me, that people would see Jesus through me and that they would hear from Jesus in the way that I speak and the words that God gives to me. I want that to happen. And I want to stay on. I want to continue doing that with my life. But how? The word ready is really the key to be on and always on. There's a light bulb in a fire station in Livermore, California, which is Northern California, that's been burning bright since 1901. It's not a special light bulb, just a very, very old light bulb. And it has never burned out. The light bulb has actually been noted by the Guinness Book of World Records, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and General Electric as being the world's longest lasting light bulb. It's been shining for 116 years. But when asked why this light bulb hasn't burned out, scientists and those that want to be able to make light bulbs that would last, you know, which would really save us a lot of money if light bulbs never went out, never burnt out. But when they found the reason why this light bulb never burnt out is because it has never been turned off. Except for a 22 minute period of time in 1976 when the fire station had to move to a newer facility they actually had to unscrew the light bulb jump in the fire truck turn the siren on jet to the next fire station and then screw the light bulb and it took them 22 minutes for that period of time luckily it turned back on and stayed on and has been on since the reason why the light bulb has never been burnt out is because it doesn't turn off It's not going off and on, off and on, off and on. You see, the secret of a light bulb never burning out is it never turning off. The reason why it shines bright year after year, decade after decade, and now century after century, the reason why it doesn't burn out like other light bulbs do is for one simple reason. It's never turned off. It's the turning on and turning off that causes bulbs to burn out. So the next time someone says, hey, you need to turn the lights off. Say, I'm trying to save you money and I don't want to burn the bulb out. Although a bad excuse because the electricity will cost you a lot more, you still could try it. And the same is true for spiritual life. What causes us as Christians to not burn out? That we would still be the light to the world, shining bright. What causes Christians to burn out, to stop shining bright? It's just like the light bulb. It's being on and off, on and off, on and off. People who who go to church for one week and then don't for the next couple. Who who say, God, I want to be in your word and, and read for a couple days and then don't for a couple weeks. Those that that serve so faithfully and then decide, I'm going to take some time off. I'll I'll, I'll turn on later. I'll get back later, but but I'm going to take some time turning off. Those that, that share boldly and proclaim Jesus in the community, and then the next moment, I don't really have time for this right now. And it's the on and then off. On and then off is what causes Christians to burn out. We ought not to live our lives that way because if we do, we will find ourselves being burned out spiritually too. If we allow ourselves to be on for one day and then off the next, on fire for Jesus one day, and then that fire put out the next, we will find ourselves being burnt out spiritually. Eventually, we won't be in our Bibles anymore. Eventually, we won't have that passion and desire to be in church with God's people anymore. Eventually, we won't want to start serving again because the time off that we've taken has been kind of nice. We won't have the desire to make a difference eternally in witnessing and sharing with people about Jesus. 
because we're so focused with ourselves internally that we no longer have time to focus on things eternally. And we will find ourselves being burnt out. And we will find ourselves falling away from God, not shining like we once did, not burning bright, but more being <laughs> dim-witted, uh, m- m- more being uh, kind of just a, a, a twinkle at best, a nightlight at most, but not shining bright like Jesus desires for us to do in our lives. And the reason why is if we don't stay on and stay shining bright for God, eventually we will be burning out in our relationship with God. And that happens because our adversary, the enemy, he attacks the back of the pack. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Moses gives the people of Israel this instruction. He says this in verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of what, church? The world. That was so good. You guys did such a good job. A plus today. Egypt is an, a type of the world. In biblical typology, in the Old Testament, you need to know this if you didn't know this. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of a New Testament doctrine. The Old Testament is a living example or a picture, and that really is a help to me because I'm a visual learner. And, you know, you might not have known this, but your Bible is really a picture book. You might be like, well, where's all the pictures? I just see words. No, it's a, it's a word picture. And so Egypt is a type of the world for us as Christians to know the world, the world systems, the things of the world, that we aren't to be of the world as we are in the world. And so too, as the people are being freed out of Egypt, as the Lord has freed you from the world and the ways of the world, remember what Amalek did to you, he says. Now, Amalek, in typology, is a type of the flesh, your flesh nature. Remember what your flesh nature will do to you when you're coming out of the world. Verse 18, how your flesh will meet you on the way and attack your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. God told Moses, and then Moses told the people, to remember the strategy of their enemy, the Amalekites. Because when the people were on their way to the promised land, which is a type of the spirit-filled life, and when we as Christians are on our way to the spirit-filled life, that is the abundant life, the life that God has called us to live, remember, don't forget this. When you've come out of Egypt, you've been delivered from Egypt, and you're on your way, remember that the Amalekites attacked the back of the pack because our enemy has the very same strategy. You see, the most dangerous place to be when you are walking in the spirit-filled life, when you've been delivered out of Egypt that is freed from the ways of the world and you've been saved by Jesus, there's a very real danger that we flip it into cruise control, spiritually speaking. That we would be those that no longer are on the front lines, but we fall to the back of the pack. We no longer are pursuing God like we once did at a time of our lives where we couldn't get enough of Bible study. We were in church every Sunday and Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and and, and in men's groups and women's groups and and in everything that we possibly could find because we wanted to be a sponge absorbing as much as we possibly could. But then it comes a time, a very real danger in all of our lives where maybe after a few months or a few years or decades that we get to a point where we're tempted to put it into cruise control, spiritually speaking. Where we're no longer pursuing the Lord like we once did. We're no longer going to the front lines to wage war against the enemy, but we're just kind of cruising along. And it's at that place where we are often picked off. You see, who gets attacked? Who fails to make it to the promised land? Who fails 
to enter the spirit-filled life, to be in the place of destiny where God has created you to be, those who are lagging spiritually, those who are not pursuing God seriously, those that say, oh, I'll get back to where I need to be one day, but right now, today, I'm just gonna do what I'm doing. I'm gonna kick back where I'm at today, but one day I'll go to where I need to be. Those that say, you know what, I've been on the front lines long enough, I've been serving, it's time for someone else to step up in that capacity. The people that say, oh, you know what, I I'm tired of doing all that I'm doing, I don't, I don't wanna have to make it to church every week. You know, that's not necessary. I still can be a Christian and not go to church that much. Those that say, the people that would say, well, you know, I want to read my Bible every day. I want to seek God first and his kingdom and his righteousness first thing like I'm told to do. But you know what? I just, there's, I got a lot going on. I'm busy. If I could get into work a little bit earlier or I could get to my day a little bit earlier or you know what? I haven't been on social media all day and so I got to catch up to see what's happening with everyone else. And the things of God get put on the back burner. And the next thing that you know, you've been married for 30 years. And now you're facing divorce. You've been serving the Lord with your life for so long. But now, dropping everything. And not having that passion and desire for the Lord that you once did. And you see people that once were used by God in such powerful, dynamic ways. People that God had a, a gifting and anointing on to impact the world in such a way that it could not be ignored as the light ought to do in dark times. People see the light. And the light isn't meant to be put under a bucket, but to be put on a lampstand, Matthew chapter 5 said, so that the light would shine. But now that light is off. Or at best, the light has been dimmed down. And you wonder, how does that happen? How has that happened in my own life, you might say? How has that happened in lives of people around me? It's because the Christian wasn't where he was supposed to be, on the front lines, but fell to the back of the pack where the roaring lion picks off his prey. As a dad, you might be really proud of yourself because you've been doing a good job. You've been a light not only to the world, but you've been a light to your family. And I commend you for that. And you might be so proud of yourself because I've done a pretty good job. I'm not perfect, but I've done a pretty good job. And there's all sorts of reasons why we can be proud of ourselves. But especially as a dad, we should be proud of ourselves for being the light to the world and a, and a light to our family and to lead our family into the Lord. That's something that we should really, really take joy in. I mean, because there's so many other things that we could try to be proud of ourselves for. Actually, there was an article I came across, reasons why dads are proud of themselves. Now, these are all horrible reasons, but I want to share them with you nonetheless. Dad said this, number one, we can go to the bathroom without a support group. I don't, I don't understand why women always have to get together. If I was a, a, a guy and we had groups like ladies do, I mean, I understand the buddy system, I guess it's safety, but if guys did that, people would begin to talk. Just saying. Number two, <laughs> why men are proud of themselves, we can take a five-day trip with just one suitcase. We can li leave a hotel bed unmade without feeling guilty about it. Number four, we get extra credit for the slightest act of thoughtfulness. Five, if someone shows up to a party wearing the same outfit, we won't hate them. We might just become lifelong friends. <laughs> we won't go to our buddies and say, do you notice anything different? Why? Because we don't do that. <laughs> Number seven, we never need to know more than five colors. Number eight, because Christmas shopping can be completed for 25 people the day before Christmas in 45 minutes or less. We're proud of ourselves for that. And maybe my favorite, number nine, 
if someone forgets to invite us to something, we still want them as our friend. <laughs> Why men are proud of themselves. But more than any of those things, especially as dads, we ought to be proud of ourselves for being the light to our family. But the word is this. We need to be those that not only have shined bright, but that continue to shine bright. You that have been dads for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, <laughs> 55 years, <laughs> we need to be those that continue to shine bright, to be on, but then to stay on. Because if we don't stay on, if we're on, then off, on, then off, we will be burnt out. And we see that even in the life of a man who is known as a man who is as of God's own heart, who had the desires that God had, a man named David. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight against the Ammonites. And they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David, who was king, stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, when kings normally would go to battle, David didn't go as king. When you as a Christian normally ought to be where you should be and you don't, and you stay behind, watch what happens. Because David, he wasn't going to war. He said, well, you know, I fought a lot of battles. I've, I've destroyed so many people that I couldn't even build the temple because I was a man of war. I mean, Saul, my predecessor, killed his thousands, but people in the streets sing about me killing tens of thousands. I had my mighty men of valor. They were called David's mighty men of valor. Man, I've, I've fought enough, long enough. It's time that I can take some time off. So I'll send Joab, my general, and the Israelite army, and I'll, I'll kick back. I'll put it in cruise control. And it was then, when David wasn't where he was supposed to be, when kings normally would go to war, David stayed behind. And it was in that moment that David fell into sin with Bathsheba. And the very sin that would ruin David and have lifelong consequences, and only by the grace of God that God still could use David and restored him, but ultimately had so many consequences from that sin, who, who lost his kingdom and what God had called him to do as king, had that all foregone. Why? Because David sinned in such a way that although God forgave him, there's still always consequences to our sin. Because David put it in cruise control. And it's for that very reason for us as Christians that when we are kicking back spiritually, when we no longer desire to impact the world spiritually, when we are kicking back, ultimately, we will find ourselves being picked off. You see, in this book called the Bible, 75% of the people who fell in their lives fell in the second half of their lives. 75%. That is, if they lived to be 80, they fell after they were 40 years old. If they lived to be 800, they fell after they were 400. You get the point. They fell in the second half of their lives. And for you, who've been walking with the Lord for some time now, there's a very real danger that if we kick back spiritually and no longer pursue the Lord, throughout the rest of our lives, that it's in the later years of our lives, the later years of our marriage, the later years of raising our children, when we start to allow things, you know, you can listen to that in the house. You're old enough to make your decision. Instead of saying, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We won't have that in this house. We won't watch that in this house. I don't care how old you are. You're 35. You ought to move out by now anyways. Amen. That was all the dads that were clapping. 
Moms were like, no, he's, you know, a few more years might be okay. <laughs> that would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, it's in the later years of raising kids, in the later years of marriage, in the later years of our walks with the Lord, that there's a danger. You see, there's a lot of danger in every season of our lives. But oftentimes in the later years of our lives, spiritually speaking, we don't realize the danger. When we're a newer Christian, we, we, we realize the danger because there's constant invites. You know, you, the Lord freed you from alcoholism and now you're invited to every single party and every single social group that you ever wanted to be a part of that you never felt a part of. Now all of a sudden, hey, why don't you come hang out with us? That's not because you got cooler. It's because the enemy's working against you to pull you back down. When the Lord freed free someone from drug abuse, I've heard it time and time and time again as a pastor. They said never before in their lives, in that first week or two, have they been ever offered so many free drugs. Why is that the case? Because Satan will do whatever he can to pull people back down. When the chains are broken, he wants to get them in bondage once again. But when the chains have been broken for so long and you've been walking with the Lord for so long and you've been married for so long and you've raised kids for so long, there's a danger that we as mature spiritual Christians often don't see and that is the danger is just as real. But you might not see it in the way because Satan doesn't tempt you in the way that he used to. It's not, hey, why don't you come party with your friends and get drunk again? It's not, hey, why don't you take another hit of that? You haven't done that for 40 years. You know, why don't we get back involved in drugs? Oftentimes, and I'm not saying that the enemy doesn't work that way, but oftentimes it's not in that way. See, the temptations look different for the spiritually strong Christian. It's not, hey, just throw in the towel and dive back into a life of sin. It's just a slow, gradual drift to the back of the pack. Slowly, but Satan knows, surely. And I can pull you away from God if I can get you to slowly drift away where you aren't pursuing God like you once did. You're not serving God like you once did. You're not reading and desiring God like you once did because you know these things. You've heard that study. You know that verse. And we can come into a place in our lives where we say, I've heard that before. I know that already. And we don't desire. We've read through the Bible three times. You know, I, I know it already. But you don't have the passion and the heart for the Lord like you once did. And God would say to you today, preach the word, shine bright, but keep the light on. Be on and always on. The solution to keeping the light on is just that. Turn on, stay on, always on. Don't allow your light to be turned off. Never turn it off. Never flick the switch, never kick back, cruise control, but you need to keep doing what God has called you to do in season, it says, and out of season. What does that mean? Well, in season, well, what season? In the summer season, ah, uh, it's summer. I'm gonna take some time, you know, to do this and do that, some personal time. I'm gonna, it's summertime, I'll vacation. And when I vacation, not that there's anything wrong with vacation, but when I vacation, I, I'm not even gonna bring my Bible. I'm not even gonna find a Bible teaching church where we're on vacation, why it's vacation. I can kick off for a couple weeks and turn my, my light off. In season, in the summer season, and in the winter season, because the excuse is the same. Well, it's winter season, it's snow season, it's ski season, it's snowboarding season. In the busy season, because we all have busy seasons, don't we? Whether it's a work busy season or just a busy season in life. Whether it's a busy season or a difficult season, a vacation season or a hard season, whatever is pulling you away from spiritual life, whatever is your light switch that would turn you off from the things of God, whatever your switch might be, distraction, dump it, trash it, scrap it, junk it, get rid of it. 
Whatever that switch is that would turn you off from being on and staying on, get rid of it. Because that gradual process will pull you away and end up cutting you off from the Lord. And I know, personally speaking, I, a couple days ago, got a really bad infection in my foot. Uh, I went to the beach for my wife's birthday and took the day off. And we went to took the family to the beach And a bacteria got into my toe from the water. You know, you think the salt water is clean. It's not. You just die from it. (laughs) And so I got a bacteria in my foot. And thinking, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I soaked it in some Epsom salt and hydrogen peroxide a couple times and kept triple antibiotic ointment on it and, and took care of it. But it slowly got worse and worse and worse until yesterday it got so bad I had a red line going up my foot and up my leg. And so I knew it was time to go into the emergency. And so yesterday I go into the emergency and and as I was about to leave, uh, I was exhorted by my my mother-in-law, Judy, who said, you know, there's a, a pastor who had an infection in his foot and just had to have his foot cut off. So I said, I said, I... I said, I'll see you later, I'm going. (laughs) And so I went into the doctor and it was so swollen and I won't go into detail about what came out when he was pushing on it, but it wasn't a a pleasant sight. And uh, I was in such excruciating pain at this point that that the doctor said, we're gonna have to do some surgery, I'm gonna have to cut your toe off. No, he didn't say that. (laughs) But that's what I was hearing as he was saying that we'll have to make an incision in your toe. You know, I just figured, you know. And, uh, and so he says, we're going to have to make an incision, and we're also going to have to give you a shot. And, and so I go through this process, and I'm on this, what I like to call an operating table bed in this emergency room. And, and they t- bring this light on, and, and then they come in, and they have this needle. And the doctor says, I, I need a 22. You know, it's a real skinny needle. And the nurse goes, oh, we don't have any 22s. We're all out. And he's like, just give me a 25 then. Oh, we don't have any 25s either. It's like, what do you have? 28. Now, if, if you know anything about needles, a 28 is like, it's like this. <laughs> and my infection is in my toe. And so now, now the, 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 the doctor has this, this spike and, he's, and he has to stick it into my toe. And, and the toe is so sensitive because of the, the infection that you barely can touch it without me screaming like a little girl. And so now he's poking it. At the same time, he's pouring this freeze off stuff that, that, that basically would freeze your toe off to make the needle not hurt so bad, and that burns like crazy too. So he's pouring that on my toe, sticking me, and he had to stick me like 10 times before it slightly went away. And I literally, I'm screaming. My other foot is kicking like crazy, and the doctor, all I can hear him say is, don't kick me, don't kick me, don't kick me. <laughs> and so long story short, I had to get a shot because of the infection that was going up my leg in the backside. But I can say the doctor finally got down to the bottom of the things. <laughs> but the whole thing was a procedure. The whole thing was a pain in the rear, honestly. <laughs> but the doctor, he said, it's a good thing that you came in now and didn't delay. Because if you would have given it another day, you may have had to lose your toe. And so I realized in that moment, I said... This will preach. This is what the church needs to hear about shots in inappropriate places and toes being chopped off. This is exactly what they need to hear about. Because the word for us today is that if we don't take care of things today, where we're at with the Lord, spiritually speaking, and we say, oh, I'll get around to getting right up with God next week, next month, next year. Not today, but someday I'll get back to where I need to be with God. It'll only be a matter of time before we find ourselves being cut off from the Lord and find ourselves not being where we ought to be in our relationship with God, so far from God that we won't even know how we got here. And ultimately, a place called hell, a very real place. It's the place that's talked about of outer darkness where there is no presence of light because God is light and in hell there's no presence of God. And so a place where the Bible calls a place of being cut off eternally from God. 
And if we don't, as Christians, or even people that aren't walking with God, maybe ones that don't call themselves Christians, or maybe those that have called themselves Christians, but you know that you're not walking right with God and not in the place where you need to be with God because you've drifted. Listen, if today isn't the day, then who knows if it's tomorrow that we'll be cut off. And so make today, make today the day that you would get right with your Father, your heavenly Father. Today would be the day where you would say, not tomorrow, next, not next week, not next year, but today is the day where I wanna be right with God. I wanna be restored into a right relationship. And you might be saying, well, how do I do that? How do I get right with God? Jesus gave his life So it wouldn't be based on what you do to work your way to God. Every religion is based on you working your way to God. But Jesus, he came to the earth as God, but in the form of a man, being 100% human, but 100% God. But he lived a perfect life and he paid the price in giving up his life on the cross for each of our sins, knowing everything that you would ever do. And he paid the penalty for that. So that all you would have to do today is say, Lord, I want to receive this free gift of salvation. This free gift of eternal life. This free gift of forgiveness. And God, I want to let the light come in, the light of God to come into my life. And God actually says that he stands at the door of your heart and is knocking. And if any person would open that door, open their heart to God, that God would come in. And the light will come in and you too will begin to shine bright. Listen, don't let the light be turned off. And if it's off, then we need to be those that turn on and stay on. In Jesus' name, amen.